everyone, and thank you for coming to today's Play Attention webinar. My name is Gwen Sorley, and I will be your host today. I really do appreciate all of you taking some time out today to chat a little bit about how to make ADHD your superpower. And I do hope that at the end of this webinar, you have some take homes, things that you can do personally or with your clients or with your children to help really make some of the characteristics we typically hear uh, associated with ADHD, manage them and make them into a positive. So a couple of things I want to mention before we get started. One is that we are recording this event. So at the end of the webinar, you will receive an email with the recording link. That way you'll be able to watch the presentation again or any areas that you may have missed or you can share it with any staff members or family members who are unable to attend the live event. Also, there is a chat box at the bottom of the screen. So at any time, if you want to interact with me, type in a comment or a question, just click on that chat box and feel free to insert uh, your question or your comment at that time. Many times when we talk about ADHD, you will actually hear many of the same characteristics. So you'll hear that you're a daydreamer or you have difficulty transitioning. Maybe you're overly emotional, impulsive, or hyperactive. And a lot of times when you see these listed online or you're having a conversation with your child's teacher, these are mentioned as negatives. However, they can actually be very positive characteristics. We simply need to know how to manage them because you have amazing traits, amazing characteristics, and if you can manage them, then they can become your superpower. So let's take another look at all of those typical characteristics we hear about that are usually brought up as a negative. Are you accused oftentimes of being a daydreamer? Probably many of you have caught yourself daydreaming during a staff meeting, or perhaps you go into a meeting with your child's teacher and the teacher says, you know, he just seems to be daydreaming an awful lot during my class when I'm teaching math. He just looks like he's off in another world. If you can manage that daydreaming, you can really unleash some creativity and happiness. So we don't want to lose that part, right? You still want those daydreaming moments you just need to know how to manage it. Daydreaming can actually allow us to think of new solutions and possibilities. Probably one of the most famous daydreamers ever was Einstein, right? Everyone think, talks about Einstein and how his parents and teachers always described him as a daydreamer. But he referred to those moments of daydreaming as his thought experiments. So even Einstein knew that those moments were his most creative moments, were the moments where he was able to do what he called his thought experiments. So how can we manage this to keep it as a positive? You want to identify times you daydream but shouldn't, right? There are optimal times for this and you really have to start reflecting on certain things that are happening during your day. If you never take that time to reflect, then you're never going to be able to identify and really better self-regulate. So it's important you look at your day and identify those times. And you might catch yourself in the moment, so you may want to jot them down as they're occurring in the moment, because as you and I both know, by the end of the day, we've had so much that's happened, we may forget what we thought about earlier. So identify times that you daydream but shouldn't. So this may be a time where you're involved in a conversation with your spouse. It's an important conversation and your spouse is talking to you and suddenly says, so what do you think? And you have no idea what was said because your mind had drifted into a daydream. So that is a point where you know, let's jot that down when I'm having important conversations, when I'm in a meeting at work, these are specific times I need to try to self-regulate and self-monitor my daydreaming. 
However, remember, we don't want to lose that part of us, right? We want that time for creativity and happiness to occur. So give your time, yourself time to daydream. Make certain that throughout the day you unplug, meaning you detach yourself from all of that technology that's constantly distracting you. So unplug, go outside, uh, go for a walk, lie in the grass, do something different. And you'll see that those moments can be your most creative moments. A lot of times when I'm taking a walk or riding my bike or even doing yoga, I'll have these ideas that I think are pretty good, um, but they are moments where you wouldn't think you'd be creative or coming up with your best ideas, but be aware that those can be critical times for you. And use visualization in your daydreaming. Sometimes daydreaming, your thoughts are going into different directions, but you can use visualization as part of this and really visualize certain goals that you want to reach. A lot of very successful uh, people in our society, in professional sport athletes, or people who are very successful in business, they'll often talk about how they use visualization as one of their tools to their success. While you're visualizing, while you're daydreaming, make certain that you let go of negative thoughts. A lot of times we're very negative, very hard on ourselves. So this is a time where you should let go of all that negativity. Don't just daydream about what you want, daydream about how you will achieve it. This is part of that visualization. If you're incorporating visualization and you have certain goals in mind and you're daydreaming and visualizing yourself reaching that goal, don't just think about the goal, but start thinking about all the steps you would do in order to achieve it. If this seems like something you really want to work towards, write it down. After you're done with that moment, write it down. Do you want it? If you do, you can take action. But keep everything in perspective, right? Not every daydream can come to fruition. You want to keep everything in perspective and decide what daydreams you want to take action on. And share your dreams with others. Now, it's really important, and a lot of these uh, different techniques that we're going to talk about, I hope you do modify them for both yourself or your clients or your child because they can uh, extend through all ages. So help your child manage their daydreaming. I think when I do consultations with a lot of parents, the first thing I'll ask is, well, what's great about your child? And I would say 95% of the time, they'll say, you know, he's really creative. She's really creative. And I hear that all the time. So we don't want our children to lose this part of them, but it is important, again, just as adults, it's important we help them manage their daydream. So again, with your children, you can help identify times where daydreaming is appro appropriate and where they may need to self-regulate and really manage and not daydream. Obvious times during school, when the teacher is teaching a lesson, it's really important that you control that daydreaming for that portion of the day so that you're able to take in the information that's being taught during school. If you can help them identify these moments, it'll be easier for them to reflect and self-regulate. But again, just as we want to do as adults, encourage time for daydreaming. And so make certain that your children too have times where they're unplugged, right? There's no technology involved. They're out in the grass. They have a stick and a ball and they have that opportunity to be creative. And once this occurs, when they start talking to you about what they've imagined, what they've been daydreaming about, recognize it. Ask them to share their thoughts, encourage it. They can share their thoughts depending on their age in writing. They can just talk to you about it or even draw pictures and then evaluate some of those things. Are these things that we should do? Are these things that we can do? This is part of that perspective. If they've imagined some type of uh, invention, is it something we could actually try to create? 
give them an opportunity to share and explore their daydreaming and their creativity. Now, the flip side of daydreaming, of course, is hyperfocus. I'm sure many of you out there are familiar with hyperfocus. And you know, sometimes it's a little bit confusing because we hear so much about attention deficit, and that's really a misnomer. There is no one with a complete deficit of attention. Usually you have great attention, it's just scattered over a variety of things, or you have the ability. If it's of high interest or high stimuli, you can actually hyper-focus in certain situations. Now, this can be a good thing because you could be very productive during these times of hyper-focus, but it also can be a negative thing if you have difficulty with mental flexibility, where you have a hard time transitioning. Remember, mental flexibility is a big part of executive function that you have a hard time transitioning. Once you're in that hyper-focus, you have a hard time shifting to another situation. Or it can be uh, difficult if you get so hyper-focused and you think, this is great, I'm very productive, and yet you were supposed to pick the kids up at 3.30 and you're so hyper-focused that now it's four o'clock and you're half an hour late already to pick up your children. So the key is to manage your hyper-focus and channel that attention to useful goals. So how can we manage hyper-focus? This is something that I think as an adult especially, but remember we can teach these strategies to our children because they are hyper-focusing, right? But teach them and this is something that's going to really take some practice. So once again, just like identifying times that are appropriate for daydreaming, we want to identify what triggers your hyperfocus. Is it a particular time of day? Is it a particular subject area? Perhaps it is a particular activity. What triggers your hyperfocus? Then take steps to manage it. Ask yourself when you are in that moment of hyperfocus. Catch yourself and ask yourself, am I doing something useful, okay? If you ask yourself, am I doing something useful, and you're in the middle of the workday and you find that you're hyper-focused on a video game, then the answer is no. If the answer is no, then practice removing yourself from that situation, physically removing yourself. Get up, walk around, readjust, get in a different mindset, and come back. If the answer is yes, there are some steps that you can take in order to continue hyperfocus because you've identified that you're doing something useful. But now let's take some steps to manage that hyperfocus so you're not a half an hour late to pick up your children or you're not, you know, three hours late to a meeting. First, identify what you're working on and write down your goal. Remove all distractions, although you're hyper-focused, so you probably are going to be able to filter out a lot of those distractions on your own. Decide an appropriate time frame for your focus burst, okay? So right now you know that you've identified maybe your peak time for hyper-focus is 10 o'clock in the morning. And now it's important to know what is an appropriate time for this, this focus burst. What else is going on in my day that I need to address? Do I have 30 minutes? Do I have an hour? Do I have to leave for work in 45 minutes? So I really should only give myself 30 minutes right now because I need that 15 minute block of time to transition. So think about that appropriate time frame for this hyper focus or this focus burst. And then set a timer. If you said 30 minutes, set that timer to 30 minutes, okay? <clears throat> when the timer goes off, take a water break and a movement break and reassess. So once you've, your timer's gone off, you can just take a little break because we want you to be able to transition, right? We don't want you to just only focus, hyper-focus and not be able to shift. 
So take that mental break and then assess how much time do I have left to actually work on this activity? Do I have another appointment or is there another task that needs to be addressed? Once you've done this break and assessment, then if you can continue working, reset your timer and repeat this. This is why I say hyper-focus and managing hyper-focus can take practice. There are a lot of steps in managing this, but you will find that if you can manage it, you can be very productive and achieve great things. If necessary, ask a friend to help you with this process, this practice. And you can just discuss with your friend or your spouse that you have a difficult time with hyperfocus, that it can be good, but just to check in with you to make certain that you're not missing other tasks that need to be addressed. Are you very emotional at times? You know, we hear so much, again, as part of executive function, that inability to control emotions, that emotional control. So you may be thought of as very emotional at times, but truly, this can be passion. And passion is a good part of our lives. Passion makes you feel good. It leads you to success. Makes it hard to quit. If you're truly passionate about something, it's really hard to give up on that. Also, it helps you grow and allows you to affect others in a positive way. But I think when I talk about passion and finding your passion, and we hear a lot about that in media, I think the number one thing that's asked next is, but I don't know what my passion is. How do I find my passion? Or, you know, my child, she's 13, and I'm really having a hard time finding what she's interested in. So consider taking a passion or conducting a passion interview. And you can do this with yourself. You can do this with your clients. You can have this activity with your child. It could be an activity you do together at the dining room table. Just have this conversation with these prompting questions. What brings you happiness? What makes you smile or laugh? What is meaningful to you? And if you're asking these questions to your child, especially if your child is a teenager, sometimes you're going to hear, I don't know, right? That's the number one answer sometimes whenever we ask whatever the question is, I don't know. So make certain you don't just give up there. If they say, I don't know, model that for them. You know what I think? I saw you out on the soccer field and you looked so happy. Is that a time where you're happy? Or remember when we went and we visited your grandmother in the, in the nursing home and you were talking to all the other people there and you were reading them books, you were so kind to others and you looked so happy and you were making others happy. Is that what you're passionate about? Is that what makes you feel good? So model, use prompting questions. Just don't leave it at, I don't know, but take what you've known about your child or what you've uh, observed, but take that time for yourself as well. What are your skills and talents? And then looking at those first four things, is there a common theme that's unraveling? Brainstorm the different possibilities that come from that. So if your child says, yeah, you know, I really do like uh, visiting grandma in the nursing home and working with all those individuals. Well, great. Let's look for a volunteer program where we can do that more often. Sports, if that soccer field is what make you, makes you most happy, what can we do to further that? And then do a reality check. Is this something we can pursue, right? Because not every idea is a great idea. Let's see if we can really pursue this and then write down the steps to take action. Because if you don't write it down, it's going to be difficult to achieve it, right? Everything we should get down those steps in order to take our next step. 
And always remember to try something new because you never know if you don't try new things all the time, you never know what might be your passion, what might be your talent. I continually try new things and explore new things. I've tried art classes and I can tell you that art is not my passion. I am not good at it. I am not crafty. So that's not a passion, but I've tried it. Most recently though, I watched a documentary on bees and how we're losing our bees. So in January, I started a beekeeping course. And now within the next couple of months, I am going to be an official beekeeper. And I can tell already that I'm very passionate about this. Before January, I really knew very little about the subject. And now I'm certain my husband is sick of hearing about bee facts. And, and uh, I'm sure I'm going to start with two hives, but have many. So you never know what may become a passion of yours. So make certain to always put yourself out there and try something new. Not everything is going to be great for you, but if you don't try, you'll never know. Now, this is very related to being a risk taker, right? Finding that passion and seeking out opportunities. And many times people with ADHD often are willing to take risks, right? You're willing to put yourself out there. You think outside the box, you see opportunities that other people miss. And you're willing, not only do you recognize those opportunities, but you're willing to take action. You're a risk taker. But we have to evaluate. There's impulsive risk taking, and then there's calculated risk taking. You've probably heard many, many times to look before your leap. You leap, right? So a lot of decisions that you make have some sort of risk attached. The key to being successful is calculating that risk and minimize the negatives and maximize the positives. So we can all look at this mountain and we can see how beautiful it is, but we know that if we want to climb that mountain, there's a lot of risk involved in that, right? Now you may think, I would love to be able to do that. I would love to be able to climb that mountain and see that view, see that sunset, experience that adrenaline rush that they must get when they get to the top. An impulsive risk taker, will then put on his sneakers, grab his backpack and a little bottle of water and start out towards that mountain. That's probably not a good idea, right? That's impulsive risk taking. If you are doing risk taking and you're thinking it through, you're managing that risk taking opportunity, then you're researching, what type of equipment do I need in order to take this risk, to climb this mountain? What type of physical training do I need to do? And you'll do that physical training. You won't go out there alone. You have a partner with you, at least one other person. You have all the safety, you have the training, you have the physical um, stamina in order to achieve this. That's managed risk taking. You both take a risk because no matter what, this is a risk, but one is impulsive and one is managed. So let's take a look on how to take calculated risks. Once again, identify, write down your idea. Do your research. What are the different pros and cons associated with this risk? What are the resources that are required? Develop a support group around you. So talk about what you're willing to do and listen to the negatives because as you probably know, there are going to be a lot of people who say, oh no, you know, you shouldn't do that because take it all in and really evaluate the pros and the cons, but then also gather people around you once you've decided that this is a good calculated risk Bring people around you that are going to support you. Anticipate mistakes, not only the cons of, you know, well, what if this doesn't happen? What if this doesn't work out? But anticipate some mistakes that could lead to an end result that is not a positive. So anticipate some of those risks 
that's a really good tip for life, but in business as well, many successful business people will say that they're constantly anticipating what mistakes could be made along this path. So look at that as part of your uh, points to refer to. Lay out a roadmap with goals and checkpoints. So you have certain goals you're going to want to reach and checkpoints to look in on. Be willing, be flexible, right? Be flexible in your plans because things are going to change. Things are going to happen that you're not going to expect. So be flexible and be willing to change the plan when necessary. As always, celebrate those successes, okay? When it happens, celebrate your successes, but not every calculated risk is going to work out for you, right? So make certain that you take time at the end and learn from those failures as well. So if you were successful, reflect what made this successful. And if you were not successful, reflect what really led to the failure of this. Okay, now this is something that you can do as an adult, but if you look at these steps, you can think about how to adapt this with your child and take them through that process as well. You can do that as a family. <clears throat> how to use high energy for success. So do you feel like you or your children have a lot of excess energy? It's a really powerful thing to have lots of energy because you can probably get a lot done in the day once you have your mind to it, but we need to know how to manage it. And this can all be related to your passion, right? A lot of these things that we discussed can go back to uh, bringing it all together because they're all interrelated. So once you find your passion, you can channel all of your energy towards success on the playing field, school or work. If you think about Leonardo da Vinci, right? He's another one in our history they say was ADHD. And if you think about all of these different areas we chatted about so far, in order to do what he created in the Sistine Chapel, right? He had to have been passionate. He had to have a lot of energy in order to create that. And probably was able to hyper-focus quite well. So you see how all of these characteristics come together and can be an amazing attribute. So once you find your passion, put all of that excess energy that you have into that passion. Again, like the other areas we've discussed, identify good times for high energy and bad times for high energy. This is important to reflect on with your child as well. Find outlets, so if your child has that excess energy, find outlets where the fun activities and energy bursts can be uh, done. Have clear limits for certain settings. So if there are certain settings where energy has to be reined in a little bit, have clear limits. So if you're chatting with your child that this is a time where we really have to control some of that energy, and you're setting those limitations and you have that discussion, have them repeat it back to you so you know that they understand and they've processed what you've talked about for that situation. Teach your child calming skills because although there may be a moment for high energy, if you're at, let's say that you're at a, um, a party, maybe even a birthday party, and you know that there's times during that social interaction where high energy is had by all and it's appropriate, but then there are moments where they're going to have to rein it in and bring it back down, right? So teach those calming skills so that they know how to bring themselves back down because sometimes if they don't have those calming skills, you'll see how it kind of spins out of control because there is so much energy and they get so excited. So make certain that you have those calming skills, not only as children, but this is important as adults as well. And that can be some breathing exercises you practice, that can be some mindfulness techniques that you've incorporated, or if you've even tried uh, some meditation. It can be some slow movement, it can be just 
you know, walk away and walk in the grass and come back. So teach and practice some calming skills so that when there is that high energy, there's also a way to bring yourself back down when it's appropriate. And schedule your day around your energy for best results. So when we talk about those times of day, the, you may find that you have the most energy at 11 o'clock in the morning. Maybe you're not an early riser, you have a really hard time sleeping and you, know, you feel really groggy, but you identify that you know, about 11 o'clock, you have a lot of energy. That might be a good time for your hyper focus and your high energy. Plan your events around those times where you know that you are going to be able to use that energy uh, for some high productivity. So I hope some of these uh, tips and strategies help you reflect on some of these characteristics that often are seen as a negative, but I hope that this gives you a new perspective. If you haven't thought of it in this way before, maybe you have a new perspective of some of these characteristics that you exhibit or that your child exhibits. And you can start discovering some of these superpowers that you have because you truly have some amazing capabilities. You just simply need to know how to manage it. And we've learned that from all of our favorite superheroes, right? One of our favorite superheroes says, with great power comes great responsibility. I think it was his uncle that said that to him. And it is your responsibility to learn how to hone your superpowers and manage them. Because once you can manage them or teach your child how to manage them, then great things can occur for you. But we talked a lot today and I gave you lots of different tips and strategies. Keep in mind that no one expects you to go out within 24 hours and try everything on all five points, right? You can't expect yourself to take this webinar and start applying all of these strategies in your day-to-day -day life. Think about what we discussed. Maybe choose one thing. Maybe it's find your passion. Just focus on that. Take some of those steps. Maybe you know already that hyper-focus, that's you, and that you have a great opportunity to use that hyper-focus in your job or in some type of sport. So take some of those steps and start practicing those steps. But don't get overwhelmed because we talked a lot about a, diff a lot of different areas. And I know as adults, sometimes we want to try everything right away and make it all happen for ourselves tomorrow. And that's not realistic. So keep it all in perspective like we talked about earlier. Select one thing. Select one thing for yourself, one thing for your child, and start working on that. Maybe even work on that together. Maybe find your passion is something both you and your child can work on today. So I hope these tips and strategies were helpful to you. And uh, I will send you, some of you have been asking about uh, the webinar recording. So remember, I will be sharing this webinar recording with all of you. Now, to take it a little bit further, many of you have been considering play attention as well, because in order to start using some of these tips, it's going to be really essential for you to start developing all of those core cognitive skills that are necessary for strong executive function. Because once you can, ex you can strengthen executive function, you'll be better organized, You'll be able to improve that mental flexibility. You'll be able to control your emotions. You'll have that emotional control. You'll have that opportunity to improve your ability to control your impulsivity so that you can be impulsive and spontaneous, but take calculated risks. And that's where play attention can help as well. Play attention is a comprehensive program that integrates feedback-based technology with cognitive skill training and behavior shaping to provide you with a customized program to help you develop all of the cognitive skills that are necessary for strong executive function. And when you have strong executive function, you'll be able to take all of these characteristics that we talked about today and truly make them positives in your life. So,
feedback-based technology, that's our body wave technology. Now remember this body wave technology monitors brain activity indicative of your attention. And we then allow you to control all of the cognitive exercises that we pinpoint for your plan. You're able to control those just with your mind or more specifically, your attentive state alone. And everyone's customized plan will develop all of those core cognitive skills that are necessary for strong executive function and self-regulation. Mm -hmm.